And we continue through our chapter 29 in OpenStax College Physics on the area of quantum mechanics, a new branch of physics developed in the early 1900s. And some questions that we might consider here is, when is it appropriate to use the wave model versus the photon or particle model for light? Uh, do objects that have mass, you know, the electron, proton, baseball would be some examples, footballs, cars, do they travel as waves between point A and point B? And is there a limit to how well we can make measurements for certain quantities? And quantum mechanics has uh, some insight for us on these questions. So here is uh, again our double slit experiment with waves passing through the, uh, the two openings and we get an interference pattern on the screen. We use the wave model when light is traveling from uh, one place to another. We use the photon model, a kind of a condensed energy, uh, the photon model, I won't, don't want to say the word particle of light, but a uh, restricted uh, range of where it uh, exists, perhaps a way to say it, but the photon localized energy. Uh, we use this if light is emitted or light is absorbed. We talk about a photon being involved in that process and not a wave. So this is sometimes called the particle wave duality, the particle wave duality. In some cases when light is traveling, it's best to use the wave model. In other cases, when light is emitted or absorbed, it's best to use the quote-unquote particle model, the photon model. Uh, so carrying on with this, uh, the subject of matter waves, things that have mass and behaving like a wave when they travel. So, you know, we uh, came to understand in the early 1800s, light travels as a wave with the double slit experiment. Einstein in 1905 explained the photoelectric effect with the photon model, the uh, uh, quote unquote particle model of light. And so 1923, a physics student, de Broglie, made a hypothesis in this basis of symmetry. Uh, perhaps particles are waves when they're traveling. So he said there was uh, an associated wavelength for particles as they travel from uh, one place to another. And he calculated the wavelength with Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. So H is Planck's constant, approximately 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Um, and the mass would be whatever object we have here, electron, proton, baseball. Um, the wavelength would be from peak to peak of the wave as it travels. And uh, de Broglie made this hypothesis. Later it was confirmed with particles, electrons, exhibiting diffraction, exhibiting interference, constructive and destructive in uh, 1927. So here is an electron diffraction pattern, an electron beam going through a crystal. And the crystal acts a little bit like a diffraction grating in that there are many planes in the crystal. Those act like the openings of slits, essentially, uh, with the electron kind of scattering off of each atom becomes a source of a new electron wave. And those waves constructively interfere to produce these dots out here. The, the electron beam is not what you're seeing out here. It's more the central maximum. But the electron <coughs> waves are scattering off of the atoms. And those waves have either constructive or in between here where it's dark, destructive uh, interference. And we detect the electron at a location of constructive interference. So this is a very well confirmed idea. Objects, when they travel, act like a wave. They have a wavelength. So we'll explore that just a little bit. But here's a diagram uh, from our book that shows, again, the electron beam coming in with the wave nature of the electron represented in the drawing. And the electron scatters off of atoms in the crystal. Um, if we have an even uh, integer extra path length of wavelength, even integer wavelength, then of course we're going to get constructive interference, very similar to the thin film interference that we talked about. 
So good evidence, objects do have an associated wavelength. Here's another example. Uh, the electron beam is now going through two slits. If we just observe for a short time, each of these dots are where the electron has been found to exist on a screen. If we uh, let the electron beam go through for a longer time, we get this pattern. Even longer time, this pattern. Even longer time, we get this final pattern. And you'll notice that there are interference fringes here where we have constructive interference and getting a lot of electrons. It's likely that electrons will land here. It's unlikely that an electron will land in between the two uh, constructive interference maxima. So we have max, min, max, min, uh, as we had with light. And here's a, just another reinforcer. On the left here, this is a pattern produced by electrons going through a double slit. On the right side, we have protons going, or photons going through a double slit. I'm pretty sure this should be photons. This is mislabeled, um, but photons going through the double slit. They're trying to indicate to you that there's an equivalent wavelength. You can see the spacing of these fringes is about the same. And we can get electron waves that are about the same wavelength as light. We can do a lot of adjusting of the electron wavelength. So we can take advantage of that. We can build a microscope if we use electron waves. The lenses here are a little bit different. What do you think would make a good lens for an electron beam coming through here? What can apply force to electrons and adjust their path? Well, electric field and magnetic field. So those can be used and get some focusing of the electron beam and let the electron beam go across our target and observe the, uh, the details of that target. Uh, an even a little better design for the electron microscope is a scanning electron microscope. Again, we have deflect de deflection coils. Um, the lenses are electric and magnetic lenses, not uh, glass lenses. The electron has to move through them, and electrons don't go through glass. So we just have electric and magnetic fields do the focusing, and then the beam is swept across the sample. And as electrons are scattered off of the uh, sample, uh, those are detected here. The electronics knows where the beam is scanning and can pick up the details of the object um, as it gets more electrons scattered from it. So some of the results, uh, a fly, and look at all the details and the structure of this, uh, this fly. Uh, maybe that's where somebody picked it up and put it on the, on the mechanism. Um, or blood cells. Again, you, with the electron microscope, you can see much smaller objects than you can with visible light microscopes. That's because the electron wavelength can be adjusted to be very small. Uh, the wavelength depends on the speed of the electrons, and that can be controlled so we can get very small wavelengths. We need small wavelengths to see details of objects. So that's the uh, electron microscope. Um, so then uh, uh, probability with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, maybe just to go back to uh, the, the wave nature of the electron for just a minute here. Um, get back to our equation. The wavelength is Planck's constant divided by mass divided by velocity. What type of objects will have a small wavelength? We'll take a look at this uh, Planck's constant, 10 to the minus 34. Um, if we're going to have a large object here, a small number divided by a large number, uh, you're going to have a very small wavelength. If we put an electron in here for the mass, the electron mass is roughly 10 to the minus 31, and that partially cancels the uh, 10 to the minus 34, so we can get a bigger wavelength. but. Again, further back in our course, we discussed that we get diffraction interference effects being apparent when we have a wavelength that's approximately the same size as the object. Um, so if you throw a baseball through a door, it does travel as a wave. However, the wavelength is extremely small. Um, lambda is extremely small for a moving baseball, and there will be no observation of diffraction the ball will go kind of where you expect, straight ahead. 
Uh, it does not have an interference maximum off to the right or off to the left by 20 degrees or something, as we calculated for some of the light going through a double slit. Uh, so everyday objects, they do travel as a wave, but their wavelength is so small that they don't exhibit diffraction or interference effects. We need a very small mass object to give us this effect, and we have that with electrons and protons. So just wanted to uh, emphasize that a little bit. Now let's go ahead and talk about Heisenberg, another German scientist. Uh, so there's a lot of good science being done in Germany in the early 1900s. Um, so Heisenberg worked with quantum mechanics. This, some people call it wave mechanics. It deals with probability. Um, and he made some good advances in our understanding of how we make measurements. Uh, he also I don't know the full story here, but uh, chose to work with Nazi Germany in uh, working on their bomb project. Um, I think most people would say fortunately, the United States atomic bomb project uh, had more success than the German atomic bomb pro program. But let's go into his uncertainty principle. Let's talk about the science that Heisenberg came up with. Two uncertainty principles here. One, it's impossible to make perfect simultaneous measurements of the position and the momentum in that direction for an object. So we have delta x, that's the uncertainty in position in the x direction, and the momentum has an uncertainty in the x direction. The multiplication of these two quantities is going to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. So we cannot make perfect measurements. These uncertainties cannot be zero. That would be a perfect measurement of position or a perfect measurement of momentum. Um, we're always going to have some uncertainty. The better you try to know the position, the worse uh, uncertainty you're going to have, the bigger uncertainty in the momentum. Um, or if you try to restrict the momentum, getting real good knowledge of the velocity, if you make delta p sub x very small, delta x will get bigger. Over here we have a constant. So if one number gets bigger, the other number gets smaller, and vice versa. If one number gets smaller, the other number gets bigger. Um, momentum, just a reminder, we're working with non-relativistic situations here in our discussions here. So we just simply do momentum as mass times velocity. And this delta p can be rearrange delta P equals M times delta V and we'll use that in some of the problems. Uh, so what type of object will have a large value for delta X? Well, if we put an electron in here that's going to be a really small mass again 10 to the minus 31 that's going to tend to make this delta P a small number and that's going to make delta X a bigger number. This has some implications for the atom that we'll talk about uh, when we talk about the structure of the atom. The second uncertainty principle is that there's an uncertainty in the energy of an object. If we multiply that by the length of time we're making this measurement of the energy, these two quantities together are greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. So if we just measure for a short time, if delta T is small, we're not going to get a good number for the energy. This delta T E will be big. If we measure for a long time or have some situation where the system is in the same state for a long time, if delta T is a big number, then delta E can be a small number. And again, this has some consequences for the atom and the way the atom emits light. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And there are just the last miscellaneous topics for our uh, quantum mechanics. Um, we do have this complementary way of looking at things. Light is a wave, light is a particle. Objects travel as waves, or objects are particles, depending on their situation uh, and the nature of the problem. But uh, very interesting in the way the world of small structure works quantum mechanics. And there's some new things that we're just not used to, but they are, they are true. They've been checked out with experiments. Experiments have verified quantum mechanics. Keep uh, reviewing, working sample problems, and asking your instructor some questions.